There are often machines which are loved, and perhaps even justified, simply because of the rule of cool. Their functions may be limited or non-existent, and their ability to walk uphill may be even as finite, and even the traits it possesses, which people think of being so authoritatively superior, may be grossly overstated. But nonetheless, they will garner a following for the idea that they embody, rather than their success. In today's video, I'm going to be covering a battle mech which I find fits more into this category. Namely, one of the Star League's last hurrahs. The Annihilator. An assault mech weighing in at 100 tons, the origins and development of the Annihilator have been subject to change to some extent since its initial introduction. Originally, the first variant appeared to be the ANH-1A, which was introduced in the Wolstergoon sourcebook, and that was published in 1989. This seemed to hold true for much of the 1990s and even into the 2000s, before Operation Klondike was published in 2010 a source book which documents the Pentagon Wars. Within, a newer, more streamlined and dramatically more enhanced Annihilator, the ANH-1X, would be christened as the original variant, as part of the developers at the time attempting to give a facelift to many of the older Star League and Succession Wars designs. With many units within though, this was done in the context of them having late generation variants, but as stated with the Annihilator, it was displayed as being not a new model, but the original. Outside of making this a very strange fit given the lore the Annihilator possessed beforehand, it has also made covering the Annihilator now, with the eyes of decades of revisionism about it, a more complicated subject to cover, such as defining several elements of its origins or tactical use. To get a better idea behind these conundrums, and a better idea of the Annihilator itself, we're going to have to look into where it came from, and how it returned to the Inner Sphere. Built by the SLDF on the eve of the Exodus, the Annihilator existed to fight battles of attrition in the defensive, protractive battles of the Ameris Civil War. Only a handful were built before the Exodus happened and any meaningful number of these that were produced were built in the Babylon factory on Stranamekdi, the homeworld of the clans. These echoes of the Ameris Civil War would be utilized in the Pentagon Wars to help crush those who had rejected Nicholas Kerensky's enlightened rule. The Pentagon worlds found themselves disunited and unable to resist the rule of Nicholas Kerensky and his new clans and the Annihilator is one of the many mechs that would be used as a symbol for clan domination. Almost all the designs from this era fell into disuse in the Kerensky Cluster after the war and with the advancements made in technology. They would over time be phased out and placed into storage for their respective clans, though would rarely if ever be seen again in any real way. Some however would see the light of day once more, centuries later with the formation of a new unit, one which was set to launch a reconnaissance mission into what was seen as the barbaric and backwards inner sphere. Jamie Wolfe was born to a mixed background within the clans, and was not among the true-born warriors the clans prided themselves on. Instead, he was the result of a union between John Vickers, a true-born clan warrior, and a merchant-class woman named Bridget. In Clan Wolf, it was traditionally easier for Freeborns, especially those who descended from Trueborn pilots, to test to achieve the status of Mech Warrior. Both Jamie and his brother Joshua would test and achieve the status of Mech Warrior in their cast assignment trials. The Grand Council of the Clans at the time were in a vigorous debate on what to do about the Inner Sphere, with it politically breaking down into two camps, namely, Wardens and Crusaders. These entities more or less had divergent beliefs on what their founders had intended for them. The Warden clans believed in Nicholas Kerensky had always wanted the clans to act as saviors of the Inner Sphere, to avoid its corrupting influences, 
and to intervene in the inner sphere only should it require saving from either an outside threat or should it be on the cusp of disaster. The Crusader clans believed that Nicholas had, by contrast, wanted the clans to become triumphant conquerors and to restore the rule of the Star League in the inner sphere by force and to enforce the clan system on the inner sphere in order to bring about a new peace that would last into humanity's glorious future, doing away with the old political and social problems that had led the inner sphere to disaster. Also, being glorious and righteous conquerors for a warrior society has a big appeal to it. These two views were not exactly compatible with one another. A compromise in the Grand Council was made, and that was for the first time to scout the Inner Sphere, to learn all that they could about it, before making a final decision. They decided to form a new unit, almost entirely made up of Freebirth warriors, that would masquerade as mercenaries as they collected information. Jaime, along with his brother Joshua, would be offered a command, and should they succeed they would be honored with a new blood name, Wolf, created in their honor. With Jamie in command, the Wolstragoons were formed. Clan information on the state of the Inner Sphere, however, was woefully inadequate. And when they arrived, they had no idea just how badly their cover would work. Mercenary units were rarely multi-regiment, including legendary units like the Northwind Highlanders and Eridani Lighthorse. In addition, mercenaries certainly didn't have highly advanced technologies not seen in almost two centuries. And in the case of mechs like the Annihilator, they certainly didn't have mechs that there was no record of at all. The Annihilator would be deployed at first in the 1A variant, a seemingly deliberate downgrade based on the current canon rather than in its original state, which is also confusing given that they had brought over tons of other lost tech. This mech would be an oddity to behold for anyone who crossed its path, allied or not. It was a mech never seen before, in fact, in the Inner Sphere, where many projects had been lost to the histories it was a mech with no origin. This was unnerving and upsetting to many mech warriors that would see this monstrosity firsthand. Soldiers from House Liao, the Draconis Combine, and Free World Separatists would fall before the Wolstragoons, and more than a few ran into the seeming bulwark that the Annihilator was. During these years, the Black Widow, Natasha Kerensky, would become one of the most feared mech warriors in the history of warfare. Joshua Wolf would be killed as well, whom was Natasha's lover, leaving Jamie as the man really to run the unit on his own, beyond leaning on trusted lieutenants. As time went on, they would upgrade these into the 2A variant years later, before the Wolstergoons switched sides during the clan invasion, fighting back against the very invasion force that they had scouted for as it appeared in 3049. The Dragoons played a pivotal role in working with the Inner Sphere and stopping the clan advances, and informing their Inner Sphere allies as to the nature of what they faced. The Annihilator itself would come back into production, first on Outreach, and then later with Arc Royal Mechworks. It would even be seen in the hands of mercenaries outside of the Wolstragoons. New variants would begin to emerge as well, but it would rarely be seen in regular House forces, outside of some limited production buys by the Federated Commonwealth. Mostly, it would stay in the hands of the Dragoons, Calhouns, Mercenaries, and some clan forces throughout its lifetime in the Inner Sphere. This remained true even into the Ill Clan Era. The logical original variant of the Annihilator, regardless of what Operation Klondike says, and the first to see publication, is the ANH-1A Annihilator. This is for multiple reasons, including the equipment that the Wolstergoons brought with them, and with the inevitable upgrade to the ANH-2A in the 3040s. The retconned original just creates a very confusing origin, development, and evolution for the Annihilator any way it's sliced. The 1A uses standard technologies on board, meaning that it has a standard internal structure, gyro, and cockpit. In addition to this, this lumbering giant has one of the better campaign quirks it can have, which is the easy to maintain quirk. The greatest single weakness of almost every variant of the Annihilator starts with the original, which is its truthfully abysmal power to weight ratio. Equipped with an 8.5 ton Nissan 200 standard fusion engine, 
This 100 ton battle mech only has a maximum speed of 32 kilometers per hour, or three movement points in the tabletop game. To give an idea, this means that the Annihilator struggles to move into a level 1 hill or depression, and can barely move through a single hex of rough terrain. Even getting up, should it be knocked over, can be an extreme struggle. It also means it will functionally almost never be able to generate a defensive movement bonus. This also locks its usefulness on the battlefield in other very noticeable ways. Using primitive technologies compared to later battle mechs, and being mostly a ballistics mech, the Annihilator supports 8 tons of single heat sinks in order to keep the mech cool. This means it can stand still, as it more or less has to do anyway, and fire its autocannons without a problem, as well as firing up to two of its lasers. Alpha striking can be done too, though this is riskier should it happen more than one turn in a row. The strongest single point on the Annihilator is what it is named for, which is its ability to bring devastating fire onto a target with its autocannons. Armed with four Kaliyama Class 10 autocannons, with one in each arm and then one in each side torso, these four guns give the Annihilator the ability to hit targets at close and medium ranges without much of an issue. They are fed by four tons of ammunition, giving it 10 shots per cannon in this state. To back these up with two mounted in the center torso and one mounted in each arm, it has Martel Model 5 medium lasers. These are close range weapons, and are largely used to defend the Annihilator at short distances, especially once it's burned through its already low volumes of ammunition. In many ways, the Annihilator is deceptively well armed. While its four AC-10s are certainly something that it is hard to ignore in an open environment, these are ammunition-fed weapons with each missed shot lowering its usefulness in any protracted engagement. If caught at the wrong range as well, it can find itself outgunned by similar mechs in the same weight class. And should it need to find a better vantage point for its guns, it may not be able to make that happen during the engagement. Still, the Annihilator does bring a lot of firepower to the field, if it can use it. The Annihilator often has a reputation of being a fortress, something which can survive the crashing waves of incoming fire that will be coming its way due to its slow speed. This, unfortunately, is a fantasy. In its base form, the ANH series only has 12.5 tons of protective plating, or 200 points of armor. There are many heavies, 30 tons less, which bring the same or more physical defense to the field. And should the Annihilator try to act as a bulwark in a defensive role, it will quickly be undone by incoming fire from long-range weaponry. An AWS 8Q moves faster, has more armor, and carries 75% of the main gun weaponry, as well as having a better range, all while weighing 20 tons less and having the same level of technology. Worse, if the Annihilator does take too much damage and is knocked over, its limited mobility may cripple its attempts to get back up. This comparative light armor also means it cannot stand up to the various assault mechs it may have been attempting to annihilate, which is ironic. The Annihilator 1A is, frankly, a mech which is too slow to fight in any breakthrough engagements like peer assaults of similar weight, and is too under-armored to play the role of bulwark against incoming fire in the kinds of defensive roles often attributed to it. While it is heavily gunned, it has limited ammunition for its cannons, and is entirely dependent on being able to see its targets directly. Worse still, it can be outranged by major weapons, such as PPCs and LRM systems, which may mean it can simply be picked off before it can be used to its fullest advantage. It is above all a very slow mech, and one which will struggle to deliver on any map sheet or terrain board that is even remotely adequately covered by obstacles or terrain. It is a paper tiger in the most real sense, appearing intimidating at first glance, but is truly a victim to anything faster than it, or even more heavily armored. Unless completely supported by its own Lancer company at all times, it may also fall victim quite easily to a medium or light mech given its limited ability to engage with them on its own terms. It is the embodiment of inflexibility. While the 1A appears to be a strongly overrated mech, 
there's actually quite a number of Annihilator variants which have appeared since its reintroduction to the Inner Sphere. Some of these are even comical almost in all but the most niche circumstances. But I will be looking at some of the more impactful variants that have made an appearance. The direct successor to the ANH-1A. The 2A is an upgrade developed by the Wolstergoons and was used to upgrade their fleet of Annihilator battle mechs in the 3040s and 3050s. It is also the first Annihilator to see service outside of the clans and Wolstergoons, becoming available to the Federated Commonwealth, as well as to the Kelhounds and other mercenary forces. Though it would be predominantly a mercenary battle mech. It is very much similar to the original, with standard internals as well as the same armored plating. The heatsink total actually goes down by one ton, to 17, in order to install case systems to protect it from ammunition explosions, which is very helpful as the mech doesn't possess an XL engine. Outside of this, the main changes are to its armaments. Its medium lasers are upgraded to medium pulse lasers, lowering their range but increasing their accuracy and damage. Next. As the main course, it upgrades all of its AC-10 autocannons to LB-10X autocannons, giving it extra range and ammunition options. While this is an improvement over the original, it suffers its key issues, namely that it is slow and has very little protection. While this is an improvement over the original, it still suffers the same key issues, namely that it is slow and has very poor protection. It also is entirely dependent on direct fire weaponry, which may be obscured by any number of obstacles, or even from smoke come later tech levels that provide different ammunition types. Like its predecessor, and like most other annihilators, its poor movement more or less means it will struggle to reposition to deal with any kind of burden. Supposedly the original annihilator as of 2010's Operation Klondike, this Annihilator was clearly designed to make the Annihilator more palpable to modern players. The ANH-1X is a vast improvement over the 1A or 2A, something it was clearly designed in mind of being. It has 19 tons of armor, 10 double heat sinks, and otherwise has the same internal systems for the Annihilator. It is more or less armed like the 2A, though it uses medium lasers instead of pulse lasers, while it still maintains cases on board. Ammunition is also increased by 50%, giving it 15 shots per cannon instead of 10. And it has a small pulse laser as well as a small laser. While this is clearly an upgrade over the previous models, in that it has much more armored protection, giving it the ability to be the bulwark against incoming attacks, it is just frankly the case that speed is what truly makes the Annihilator bad. Even if it is sitting on an objective, it can't reposition to functionally deal with changing battlefield situations. And if its fire lanes are blocked, it is more or less unable to handle these kinds of occurrences. Its extra armor protection does, however, uplift the design overall, making it substantially more effective than prior entries. Someone at some point in the Inner Sphere decided that the only way forward for the Annihilator, which is barely able to walk forward ironically, was to provide it with Gauss Rifles. This is by no means a poor decision, but it is also not as infallible as one might imagine. For many, just having more guns will always be the answer to the problems for any mech. But the truth is armament is only a small part of what makes a battle mech work. The ANH-5W does make some major changes. First, it uses endo steel in order to save on tonnage. Some of these savings are put into a compact gyro, making it harder to disable from gyro hits on the unit. Next, it does use double heat sinks, just like the 1X, before it invests in two additional tons of standard plating, bringing it to 232 points of armor. This means it's not greatly armored for its weight, but it is an improvement over the originals, the true originals. Of course, it installs, as you can guess, four clan Gauss rifles as its primary systems. Each is surrounded by a case 2 to prevent their explosions from destroying the mech should they be critically hit. Another heavy investment is made into ammunition, giving it a total of 64 Gauss rifle rounds overall, which is 16 per Gauss rifle. This is very respectable, if the guns can be brought to bear on target. Which is the problem, because like its compatriots, it only moves 32 kilometers per hour. 
Though anyone would be a fool to discount four Goss rifles in their entirety, as each of these are a potential head clipper. To back up its Goss weaponry, it has the A2's traditional four medium pulse lasers. The real problem with the entire lineup that it can't escape is the Annihilator is good in a vacuum, against opponents who would be willing to be fed into its guns. Most map sheets or tables, however, as mentioned prior, are just not set up this way. Clearly, areas where a Gauss rifle, LB-10X, or ERPPC just have clear access to hit anything that the player wants is hard to come by, especially if its targets have any kind of mobility. Again, the Lance, Star, or company it is deployed with is going to be playing support to any whim the Annihilator has. The 5W is better than its compatriots, but it doesn't do much to solve the key problems the mech has. It is a niche mech, and even in its niche environment, it may suffer severely. The Annihilator is a battle mech with a now confused and disjointed backstory to cover where one variant was artificially placed into its backstory to make prior variants feel odd or out of place, or to not match up with the origins and timelines of the Wolstergoons themselves. It is mostly a mech fielded by mercenaries, including the aforementioned Dragoons. There are some clan-specific variants, and some older models that do seem to use clan technology as well, but these are made by the clans. In-universe, the Annihilator is a terrifying monster, like a kaiju, rising from the ocean and lumbering towards the land, its targets aghast at the horror that is coming their way. But the truth is, things only play out this way under very dubious circumstances. Only in the perfect test environment can the Annihilator achieve such dramatic results as to carry its reputation. Barring having the luck of the dice on their side, of course and that can make any machine shine. It's extremely specialized, but in fact may fail at this specialization. If a mobile or slow turrets were more successful, they would be used more often in warfare. At best, they can offer denial of access for some time, but in reality, they will usually be circumvented and destroyed by more mobile forces that they face. This is exactly the fate of the Annihilator, especially with its on average limited armor plating. All too often, the Annihilator, its pilot, and its commander believe they've got a knockout just waiting for their enemy, but they don't see the punch their opponent will deliver that will in fact knock them out instead. And when the blow lands, the Annihilator all too often just simply has a glass jaw. Thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also, a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel and I can't thank you enough because this content is only possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will catch all of you in the comment section below.